Welcome, boils and ghouls, to the Mysterious Goings On Halloween special. I'm Alex Greenwood. You know, Halloween's been my favorite holiday since I was a little boy. And you know, as an adult, I still like to capture that feeling. And I want to share that with you. That's why I put the call out to all our listeners, including some of my writer pals, to give us some of their best spooky stories. We've got some great writers here who have cranked up the fiction for you, but we also have some people who submitted just real-life happenings to us, and you're going to hear a variety of voices on this show, and it's going to be a blast. Sit back in your favorite comfy throne, light up your jack-o'-lantern, pour yourself a witch's brew, and enjoy the Mysterious Goings-On Halloween special. We'll start off with writer Jason McIntyre. Enjoy. Remembering Train Car 6. Don't forget to write, she says. Pfft. Yeah, I won't, hun. I'll have all of five minutes to spare, but I'll be sure to drop you a postcard. Morty, sweetie, dearie, she'd say. You know how I like getting regular old mail. I do. I do know Marjorie, but I'm, I'm heading out east on these infernal trains to get clients for our failing footwear distributor. Not to tell you how lovely Niagara Falls is this time of year. And what's with Margie dropping that umbrella into my suitcase? She said she didn't do it when I called her on my cell a few minutes ago, out there on the platform, where I could get better reception. In fact, she giggled at the idea she would even think of messing with my luggage. You fussy bear, she said. I don't touch your stuff. I lean back in my seat glancing to either side to see how likely it is that I'll irritate the train passenger tucked into the row behind me. It's a teen girl, about 15, with white earbuds blasting something infernal into her ear canals. She doesn't notice, so I push the button and crank my seat back all the way. Yeah, I got off a minute ago to buy a bag of honey-roasted peanuts, a Coke, and to call Margie and thank her for putting the umbrella into my soft suitcase. Oh, and I had a piss, too. Good thing I'm a dude. Hate those disgusting public restrooms. I can flush the urinal, use the doorknob, and then just drench my hands in antibacterial gel. But Margie gal, she told me she didn't put the umbrella in my suitcase. Didn't even know I had one. And I didn't either, truth be told. It's a small black number in its own little pouch. Very classy, easy to carry. Something I would have picked out myself. Didn't recognize it at all, though, and laughed a little when I saw the store tag was still on it. It's like I have my own little guardian angel. Or maybe I'm having what my mom always called a senior moment. She was only in her 60s when she started having these more and more. And that ended well for her, didn't it? I'm catching up on the age when her brain went to mush. Winked out like a porch light at dawn. And she was never the same. Now I'll be 58 in June, creeping up on 60 like it might be my own personal finish line. Wow, I need a holiday. I can't keep up with all the 25-year-olds just out of the master's programs at UT. This is when it dawns on me. I grab at my ring finger. It's not bloody there. Margie girl will kill me. 36 years of marriage, and my goddamn wedding band falls off at a train station in the middle of nowhere because I use too much hand sanitizer. Without thinking it over, I grab my soft case from the overhead compartment and head down the aisle. I need to find that ring. It's probably on the floor by the water fountain just outside the men's room. I'll make it back in time. The smokers are all still puffing away down on the platform. But I'll take my bag, just in case. Shit! I trip over the teen girl's gangly leg sticking out into the aisle and almost do a face plant onto the dirty carpet. She yanks out one earbud and gives me a sour look. Then she goes back to her magazine, stuffs that little bit of plastic back in, and that music is blasting both ears. Damn, kids. I rush down the narrow tin steps and head back to the tiny train station building. I'm sweating. It's humid, and overhead the clouds are barren and gray. Train car six. I'm in train car six. Don't forget. Morty, old pal, you're forgetting a lot these days. The umbrella, the new boots in your closet, that time you replaced the spare tire and needed it that exact day on the 401 to the office. It's like past Morty is getting present Morty out of all kinds of jams. You just can't seem to remember being past Morty. And now present Morty doesn't have a forwarding address to the past version to send him all the thank you notes. I blast into the station. Train car six, remember it, Morty? 
I look, I scour, I get down on my hands and knees on a dirty tile floor. There, in the corner, by the water fountain, in a cake of grime and dust bunnies, is my gold wedding band. I put the dirty, scuffed, 38-year-old piece of gold back on my finger. Thank God, Margie won't kill me. But how on earth did the damn thing come off my finger? A percussive blast rocks the tiny station, and everyone falls like dominoes getting a kick from a giant invisible foot. My eyes light up like fireworks, and I instinctively squint as I fall sideways from my knees to my right shoulder, cracking my head on the tile. It would have been way harder, way worse, if I'd been standing or even sitting at one of the chairs in the waiting area. My vision is blurry and my ears fill with a heavy white noise. In the confusion and smoke, I try to see my way clear of obstacles and people. I grab my soft case and make my way back out of the station. I start running through the crowd as I realize that alongside the train station, there is a giant red and black space in the line of train cars. Smoke is pouring in large billowy clouds out into the throng of panicking people. It's not car five. It's not car seven. It's car six. Simply gone now, it's replaced by twisted, blackened metal and flames that shoot upwards. Someone is screaming. It blends with the rise of sirens. Lots of sirens. I'm standing there alone in a sea of people and blown up cargo and train parts. I see among the shreds of clothing, corners from suitcases, bits of paper, cardboard, and metal. There on the scorched train platform is one lonely white earbud, its white wire trailing off to a charred and torn end, a premature end, with nothing attached to it. I look back at train car six, where it used to be, and my eyes fill with tears, not just from the smoke. It starts to rain, but I don't really feel the drops against the heat of the raging fire where train car six's wheels are the only recognizable thing. A bomb? A wiring short circuit smoldering for the last 400 miles? God, I just don't know. Someone bumps into me. Someone else nudges me and I look over. A hand is reaching out an umbrella to me, still in its pouch. Black. It's my umbrella, the one I thought past Morty, placed in my bag before this trip. Strangely, someone is handing me my umbrella from my soft case still slung over my shoulder. I take it in a daze. I open it wide and the tag dangles in front of me for a moment. I look over at the person who's just given me the umbrella and I expect to see Margie Girl with relief. But of course it's not her. She's not here. She's back home at our house, probably scrubbing out the kitchen stove. It's not her. It's me. It's who? It's me, goddammit. Standing under a nearly identical umbrella, it's a version of me with thick white whiskers and leathery skin. It's me, but not quite me. An older version of me, wearing a regretful look, a solemn face. Here, this other me is saying, Keep dry. The police will be here. Interpol too. They'll ask questions and you'll be here for hours and hours. I see you got the ring. Good. Hold on to it. Marjorie too. She's the best. Then, glancing down at the white wire and earbud on the burned concrete, he says, Sorry, Morty. I couldn't get you and her out of the train. And with that... Future Morty turns and moves through the crowd. I reach a hand out, raise my head and open my mouth to speak to him, but I'm struck dumb. I hold my umbrella over my head in the swarm of madness and noise. I rub my wedding band. Around me, but not on me, the rain falls harder, but it doesn't quell the smoke and fire of train car six. Not yet, anyway.
Hi, this is Mike from Oklahoma City, and I have an odd event that occurred to me, and it gave me chills. To this day, it still does. I had a good friend, his name was Ox. He had some kidney problems, and it got to him eventually. He called me one day, I was uh, in Oklahoma City, and it was a Sunday, and he said, I'm in the hospital, and I'm dying. I said, Ox, that can't be right. He said, can you get up here? And that was in Stillwater, about an hour away. So I drove to Stillwater. He was indeed in the ER, and he was indeed in stress. I talked to the nurse privately, and she said he's not doing well. We're going to have to ship him to Tulsa, uh, and, and we're going to have to put him on a, on a helicopter to get him there. So I said, well, I've got to go back to Oklahoma City and, and gather some things if I'm going to be in Tulsa for a while, because that's another, that's a two-hour drive from Oklahoma City. So they put him on the helicopter, and I drove back to Oklahoma City, got a bag packed, and grabbed another friend of mine, who was also a friend of his, Steve, and he was our lawyer that we used for the business that Ox ran, and I operated the business portion of that. Steve and I hurriedly drove off to Tulsa. We arrived there about eight o'clock that night, went straight into the hospital where we knew they had taken Ox, and they informed me that he had passed away before we got there. They gave me his personal effects as I was the person listed as his closest uh, friend or relative. And I, uh, Steve and I went over and stayed with my sister that night who lived there in Tulsa. And then the next morning we got up and we proceeded to Stillwater where his business was and where he was living at the time. So that's, a, that's another two hour drive from Tulsa back over to Stillwater. We were on the highway that morning <clears throat> driving to Stillwater. And uh, I was driving and my phone rang along the, along the way. We were just on the highway, it just rang. I picked up the phone, looked at it, see who was calling. And my phone said it was Ox. I said, Steve, this is really strange. And chills just went across me. He said, what is it? I said, Ox is calling. He said, well, somebody's got his phone. And I said, Steve, I have his phone. He says, well, where is it? It's, it's probably turned on and it's accidentally called you. So I reached into the middle bin in the car between the seats and I pulled his phone out and I showed it to Steve and I said, Steve, the phone is off. Hey guys, it's Sarah, Sarah, and Lindsay from the Tipsy Goes Podcast. Hey guys. Hello. Hi. We're just going to take a few minutes here to tell you about our spookiest time ever at the Belvoir Wine and Inn. Belvoir Winery Inn, and, and it Winery. is one of our favorite places. <laughs> we love it. We do. It's a obviously a winery now. Uh, it used to be an Oddfellows Asylum, but you can go and visit the spookier places. And one of our favorite spots is the old hospital, and it's haunted. And we're going to zero in on the operating room. Lindsay, mm, tell them there. what happened in the operating room. It's so exciting. So Crazy. we've been there a few times, actually before um and this was near the end of the night and we went there and in this operating room they used to house um german prisoners of war there so we had the brilliant idea to try to speak german <laughs> very fluently <in> my <laughs> while we were in there i took spanish in high school i did not take german so i was completely silent <laughs> Oh, I was too just laughing mostly so we were just we were doing the flashlight game which if you guys don't know it's um you can get intelligent responses based off the flashlight turning off and on. So we were doing that. There was a group of probably like four or five of us and one male. Um, the rest of us were all female. I promise that's important for the story. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, it's a very old building. The windows were kind of smashed in. So you could kind of hear very often the distance other groups through the windows. But otherwise, we were the only ones in the building. Sarah, I believe, was saying something about like "Sprechen Sie Deutsch." I said my <laughs> my now Nicely famous done. line is "I said Sprechen Sie Deutsch." Okay, <laughs> and one of the other girls in the group was like, 
they were just kind of taken aback that I just can speak German so fluently. <laughs> And they said, so whenever you speak German, like, they respond. And right as I said that. We heard a voice. We heard a voice. A disembodied voice. We were all standing kind of like in a semicircle. Sarah was the closest to the corner of the room. I was standing next to her. And legit, we all heard a voice loud as day in that room that said, just over your shoulder, Mm -hmm. said, I don't know German. That's what I think or, I heard. That's debatable, but it's something about German. We Very think. clearly heard German, but it was not like a disembodied voice that you you know just hear on the recordings when you're listening back for EVPs. Like we all heard it mm-hmm. with our own two ears. It was right <laughs> over her shoulder, and the other man who, or the other man, the only man <laughs> who was in the group with us was standing on the clear opposite side of the room. Yeah. So we know it wasn't him. Yep. Lindsay records everything as her personal video <laughs> I do. or I do. personal it's my diary. It's my vlog. <laughs> I missed my calling when I was in my 20s, okay? <laughs> she certainly did. And so I am going to insert that audio here for your listening pleasure. Tell us what you think it, it says. This worked last time. Speaking Sie Deutsch. So just when we And that's it. We appreciate you listening. Come visit our podcast. We're the Tipsy Ghost Podcast. We talk about spooky things, true crime things, things that, you know, some people believe in, some people don't believe in. We laugh a lot. And we laugh a lot because, because we love wine. We're always <laughs> drinking. And so. we go ghost hunting. I mean, that's the biggest thing we do. So if yeah. you like people who like to drink and tell spooky stories and go ghost hunting, you're probably our people. Come be one of us. Come be our friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay, bye. bye. They say curiosity killed the cat, but sometimes curiosity just attracts more curiosity. This is a story from Dave of Springfield, Missouri. When I was a young reporter out west, I loved to explore out in the high desert. Drawn by Indian and pioneer sites, I was curious about a ghost town even more remote than most. Drove out there over miles of broken pavement in my MGB and finally arrived at a completely deserted town, once boasting thousands of residents that had been torn down. Building materials were expensive and were moved to whatever new mining sites beckoned. Stopping the car in the midst of hundreds of remaining foundations, I looked around. There was nothing left over three or four feet high. I came to the foundation of a large building and, always with an eye to the ground for whatever artifacts I could find, I slowly walked around it. When I made it around to where I started, I saw my own footprints in the wind blown dust. My heart stopped and my hair stood on end when I saw large boot prints that had followed me around the empty remains. Clowning Around by Eden Bailey I hate Halloween with a passion. And every year it rolls around, even in this godforsaken hellhole, I am reminded of why I hate it. You're the clown. You're the crazy clown. I curl up tighter in my corner. Clowns, clowns, the clowns are going to get you. And the taunts continue until someone yells for them to shut up. When my back hurts and my bum is sore from sitting on the cold, hard floor, I drag myself to bed and plug my ears with the corners of my thin blanket. There's no use fighting it. The dream will come, as it has every year for the past ten years. The teacher asked us to dress up for Halloween. There'd be a competition to see who had the best costume. Everyone in the class would get a vote to choose the winner. Twenty-three votes, not counting my own. Miss Drage our homely grade five teacher would also get a vote. I fretted. I didn't want to do it, but I had no choice. I was already an outsider, 
and if I didn't participate, it would only draw more attention to me. That was the only reason for doing it, as the prize of a basket of candies certainly didn't entice me. I hated candy, which was another reason the kids in the class considered me strange. I stressed the entire week leading up to the competition. I threw temper tantrums and snapped at my mom every time she asked me what was wrong. Finally, two days before I had to have a costume, she'd had enough. Young lady, she said, I'm tired of your sulky behavior. Tell me what's wrong or I'm not buying you another book this month. No, I screamed. Books were my only refuge and her threat was akin to death for me. It didn't take much coaxing from her before I spilled the story of needing a costume. Damn it, she said, as if we don't have better things to spend our money on. I know, Mom. I wiped tears from my face. I know we can't afford to buy a costume. I don't know what to do. Somehow, Mom must have known this meant something to me, because aside from one scholastic book a month, I never asked for much. Even as a kid, I understood her job as a factory peacemaker afforded us very few luxuries. That night, I went to bed with my tattered copy of Stephen King's Carrie and reread parts of the book under the covers with a flashlight. It's okay to be different, I whispered as I fell asleep. It's okay if I don't have a costume. I tried hard to convince myself that I didn't care about some stupid competition. I'm making you a clown suit, Mom said when I came home from school the next day. She held up flannel material that alternated red, green, blue, and yellow stripes cut in the shape of a small body. Come here and let me see if this fits before I sew the pieces together. Oh, Mom. I rushed over and gave her a hug. Mom wrapped the fabric around me, pinning key areas. I will leave the legs a bit baggy, she said, marking off the length of the sleeves with chalk. How does that feel? I love it, I squealed. Mom sewed late into the night so I could bring the costume to school the next day. The intermittent chug-chug-chug of her Singer sewing machine, like an old steam engine, lulled me to sleep. I had a good feeling I was going to win the competition. And I should have won. My costume was the best, the most authentic, the one that looked like it cost at least $15 off the rack of a department store. <laughs> when all the kids stood in a circle, Awaiting Miss Drage's count of the votes, my confidence quickly diminished. I received one vote, and that was the one I had put in for myself. Lizzie Kemp won with 15 votes. The popular girl, the one everyone liked because they were too afraid not to like her. She had a nothing costume cut from a black garbage bag draped around her neck and secured with a clothespin. Some red food coloring streaked down the corners of her mouth. Countess Dracula, she called herself, flapping her plastic cloak when she won. She pranced around the circle with her winning basket of candies. <laughs> I always knew you were a clown, she said when she passed me, sticking out her tongue in my face. Now we all know it's true. Some of the kids laughed. Miss Drage uttered a feeble, Now, now, kids, be nice. Next to me stood Tim Shepard. He tried to dress up as a pirate, but his costume consisted of a badly constructed eye patch and rolled up pants. He didn't have a sword, so he carried a knife, a steak knife. Lizzie made fun of him, too, so I thought, I'd do us both a favor. I grabbed his knife and stabbed Lizzie in the neck. Her blood gushed dark and thick. That's what I remember the most, how dark the blood was. So much darker than the fake blood on her face. 
This is Eden Bailey, and this was my story, Clowning Around. Happy Halloween, and thank you so much, Alex, for inviting me on your show. Hey, so it's Bonnie, and here is my scary ghost story that actually happened to me. It started around 1996 or 1997, and I was living in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was moving from one high-rise to another, and I loved high-rise living. I loved being downtown, and I had the opportunity to move in to University Club Tower on the river, and this was fantastic. It was this 1960s monstrosity of a building that looks just like a ginormous hypodermic needle and in fact most people know it as the space needle it was just full of 60s charm it was a high rise i mean like a big high rise so my new apartment was on the 28th floor with a balcony overlooking the river What was cool was since it was a round building, again, it like really looks like a hypodermic needle. So I was really excited. I moved and my first day there, the movers came and with the real heavy stuff and my mother and I had just done the little things and I had a whole bunch of friends that came over to help me settle in. And so by that first evening, I was pretty well settled in. I was exhausted. So I just went into my bedroom and I tried to fall asleep and it didn't work. I remember how frustrating that was because I had worked so hard all day and I was really exhausted and I just was wide awake. And then I thought, well, I haven't really eaten much today. Maybe I need to eat something. We had gotten pizza for all the friends and there was some left. So I got out of bed and I walked into the kitchen and I remember opening up a box of leftover pizza. I realized I was being watched and that sounds really dramatic and really stupid, but I cannot describe the overwhelming feeling. I was being not only watched, I was being monitored. I was being sized up. I could feel it. It was a very uncomfortable feeling. If I had to try to put words to what I was feeling, I was feeling a presence that was really big, really black, really sinister and really ugly and I couldn't get a total picture in my mind like does this look like the creature from aliens or what but probably like alien-esque it was a very unsettling feeling so of course having a psychology background I just thought you know I'm way too tired I'm freaking myself out here put the pizza back and eat and tried to go back to bed couldn't sleep I didn't sleep a wink that first night this went on for several days after that I just could not sleep in that apartment I noticed the apartment was noisy and so I started hearing footsteps which is not unusual. It's an apartment. You know, I have people above me and on either side of me and below me. Um, So I didn't think anything about it, but I'd hear footsteps and then I'd hear glass tinkling. That's the best way to describe it. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a shattering or a break. It was just kind of glass tinkling. I remember thinking after hearing this a couple times over a couple days, thinking, what? what is going on? What are people doing in their apartments? I don't don't think I want to know. Well, from there, things got weird. I would hear knocks at the door and I would go open the door and there wouldn't be anyone there. I would start hearing music in the middle of the night and I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And I started seeing things in my room in my bedroom, I was starting to see little blobs and little dark things crawling up the walls when I was trying to fall asleep. Now again, psychology background, trying to be logical about all of this, but it still freaked me out. I, I just remember being really uneasy. So there was one night that I was trying to sleep on the sofa in the den because the bedroom just wasn't working for me. And I started hearing music and 
My apartment was on the east side of the river, the Arkansas River. On the west side of the Arkansas River, there were these, I guess it's like concert grounds. It's where they would sometimes have festivals and music, um, concerts, that sort of stuff. So I wasn't really all that shocked to hear music, but then I realized it was three in the morning. Why is this going on at three in the morning? And the music kept getting louder and louder and louder. I thought, I'm having auditory hallucinations now. Fantastic. Because I'd heard the music before, but it just kept getting louder and louder this particular evening. So I got up and I looked out the window. I was like, why are they having a concert at three in the morning? There was no music. There was no concert. I thought, okay, that's really weird. So I tried, went back to the sofa and I tried to fall asleep again, didn't work. Kept hearing the music, kept hearing the music, kept hearing the music. So finally, I went over to my balcony. I walked through the den, through my little dining area, and I walked to the balcony on the 28th floor, facing the west, because I could see the, the concert grounds from the balcony. And I thought, I'm just gonna see what's going out over there. And as I walked toward the door, each step, that I took, I started hearing something. And I started hearing, come on out, come on out, come on, come out, on out. out. And I'd stop. I'm like, what? I, I'm, I'm having auditory hallucinations again, and this time I'm really freaked out. You know, so there was that part of me that was really fighting this. I was trying to be logical. So I took another step, and I heard, come on out, come on out, come on out, come on out. I heard it a third time, come on out, come, come on, on out, out, come on out. out. And I remember just being so intrigued with these voices from the balcony. So I had prayed a lot about the situation because the knocks, the tinkling of the glass, the hearing footsteps, all of this stuff, seeing the blobs, all of it was really getting to me. And so I had been to church a lot and prayed a lot. I felt like to be completely honest, that this was a turning point. The last time I heard, come on out, come on out, come on out, I put my hand on the door to open the door to go to the balcony. And as soon as I put my hand on the door, I heard no. And in fact, like I jumped back and I, and I drew my hand back almost like it had burned me. The door handle had burned me. It's like, okay, all right. But then I heard it again, and it was the most enticing. I, I, I can't, I, I was attracted to these voices on like a visceral level. It's so come on out, come on out, come on out. And so I walked over again and I stood there and I couldn't see anything. There wasn't, there weren't windows to the balcony and the door was like a wooden door. So there, I couldn't see what was out there. I had to open the door to see what was out there. I put my hand on the door a second time. And this time I heard no, and a force pushed me backwards. It was at that point, I just started hyperventilating a little bit because I realized something significant had just happened. And I knew it was weird and I knew it was out of this world, but I didn't know exactly what. I just knew it was significant. I had, there's a couple more um, nuances to the story. Interestingly, um, I had a friend, um, a Catholic friend come over who was very well versed in spiritual warfare. And I had, you know, being Episcopalian, I had taken over holy water, which was blessed by my priest. I even burned sage, did, you know, all the stuff you're supposed to do. And the last stop before having it blessed by my priest, I invited my Catholic friend over. And, um, and she came in just to kind of see, you know, get a sense of the feel. And she walked in and she sat down and she and I had not talked much about this. I had just said, I'm either going crazy or there's a massive spiritual warfare going on here. And she had said, I'll be right over. That, that was the extent of it. So she came in and she sat down and she said, I don't know what it is, but it's really big and it's really black and it means you harm. It is malevolent. And that is exactly what I had felt that first night in the kitchen. It was at that point, I moved. 
I broke my lease. I was there at that apartment less than six months because I couldn't handle it anymore. That was in the mid 90s. In 2011, there was a young couple that was living in University Club Tower. They weren't on the, the 28th floor, but they were one of, in, on one of the floors that was high up. The woman was um, the younger, I say woman, she was early 20s, the girl. She was convicted of murder because she pushed her boyfriend out of the window and he fell to his death. She always maintained her innocence. Her side of the story was they were arguing and she was pregnant at the time, several months pregnant. So it's not like she had a lot of strength going, you know. She was very pregnant, had the belly and, you know, kind of the waddle going, the pregnancy waddle. Her side of the story was she and her boyfriend were arguing and she pushed him and he fell out of the window. Now, of course, the jury, the, nobody believed this. Nobody believed her because the force in which she must have exerted, had to have exerted to throw him out the window, to break the window and fall to his death. I mean, it had to be premeditated. There is no way she didn't stand a chance. She was convicted to 25 years in prison. Unfortunately, she committed suicide in prison, but up until her dying day, she always maintained she was innocent. When I heard that story for the first time, called my mother and I said, do you, do you know this story? And she said, yeah, I remember when it happened in 2011. And I said, mom, she didn't push him. And my mom said, I know, something else pushed him. And I never knew what to do with that information because it's not like it's going to help her. Well, A, she had already committed suicide, but B, what am I going to do? She didn't do it. It was a different force that did it. Now, who is going to believe that? I've lived with that for a while, knowing that she didn't kill this guy. It was a completely different force who was demanding a sacrifice. Now, why do I say that? Because there's one more spin to this, and I haven't found the episode. I need to find it, um, but I was talking with one of my daughter's friends. She had a couple friends over. Um, this was, I think, last year, and we were just talking about weird things that happen. So my daughter, knowing the story, said, oh my gosh, mom, you've got to tell them about your, your ghost story. I said, actually, you've, you've just got to see this building to really, for it to, you know, to understand, you know, the physics of it. So I pulled up a picture of University Club and I showed it to my daughter's friends. And one of her friends said, that's the building. I said, what, what are you talking about? And she said, my mother and I just watched a ghost story about this. And it was one of those shows that was either like my haunting or my ghost story or something like that. She said, this is the building. She said, the story followed a girl who lived in University Club. And her story was she kept hearing noises out on her balcony and voices that were telling her to go out to her balcony. She did. She went out into her balcony and the next thing she knew, she was thrown over the side of the balcony. Now she was high up also. She managed to catch herself. So she's hanging on the balcony by the rails, you know, 20 however many stories up. It was her boyfriend that happened to come home relatively quickly after these happened. He heard her screaming, went outside and helped her in. She had heard the enticements to come on out, come on out, come on out. For whatever reason, she didn't have a force that stopped her and said no. But there is something in that building demanded a sacrifice. I am scared to death at the thought of what could have happened to me at three in the morning. If I had gone out to that balcony, I'm very, very glad that I didn't, I didn't have that opportunity. Whatever force that was, whether it was God or angels or whoever else, 
whatever that force was that literally shoved me away from that door and said, no, I will be eternally grateful. I don't know exactly what's going on on that land, but I'm glad I don't have to find out. everyone, I'm Amanda Steele and this is my short story, Meeting in the Cemetery. Fred hobbled through the cemetery, relying on his stick as he took each step, pausing to look at the headstone on a nearby grave. Two names, Ellie and Emma. Twins, he thought. It must have been a tragic accident, rather than an illness to take them both. He had no time to dwell on the grave. You're late, a voice said from behind him. Fred didn't have to turn around to know that voice belonged to Brian. He turned anyway, because he wanted to see the younger man's eyes. A mouth can tell a thousand lies, but the eyes can never lie. His mother, God rest her soul, always said that, and Fred found it to be reliable at all times. Well, Brian cut to the chase. There was no point dragging this out. I'm not selling, if that's what you're asking. Brian took a step closer, glaring down at Fred, who bent over his stick, but as stubborn as usual, he refused to look away. I don't know why my mother left the business to you anyway, except she wasn't exactly lucid at the end. I could legally cheer, challenge this, and win. Fred could almost smell the lies rolling off Brian's tongue, either that or he'd been eating the weird cheese he liked so much. The last time Fred saw Moira, she was completely lucid. The things she told him about her son were enough to make him believe he had little chance of leaving this cemetery alive. Still, he went ahead with the meeting because he knew the one thing he could do to hurt Brian was not to sign over the company to him. It would go to the beneficiary of his will. The lady who served him coffee a few hours earlier and told him to have a nice day seemed like a better candidate than Brian for taking over the firm. Fred only wished he would be around to see the look on Brian's face when the will was read out, and he realised he still wouldn't get his grubby hands on his family's decades of hard work. Fred was snapped out of his thoughts by the feeling of cold metal pressing against his neck. I should slit your throat and be done with it, Brian hissed. His hands shook, drawing a drop of blood on Fred's neck. The pain was equal to that of a shaving nick but it made the old man wonder how much pain it would cause when Brian delivered the fatal cut to sever his life. He closed his eyes and waited for it, but the incision never happened. You've been naughty, a young girl's voice cut through the silence. Yes, very, very naughty, another girl spoke. Her voice sounded like she had a sore throat. Fred opened his eyes to see twin girls. Each one was wearing a top with the letter E imprinted on it. He wasn't sure why, but he thought, Ellie and Emma? No, it can't be. He was still trying to work out what was happening when their features contorted, and instead of pretty little girls, they became monsters or demons. What? What are you? Brian asked. You don't remember? Your mother knew what you did. Fred's mind flashed back to the night before Brian's mother lost her fight against cancer. He understood why Brian could claim she wasn't lucid. But he looked her in the eyes and could tell she wasn't lying, and she was far from confused. What Brian did, it was so despicable, and he thinks I don't know. Know what? Fred leaned closer. His father told him, unless he put in the work, he wouldn't inherit the business. But he went to an occultist and... Brian waited in silence for her to continue. The way he sacrificed those innocent girls to get his way... I don't care what kind of deal he made. He won't be in the will. He's a monster. He killed girls? Yes, it was so awful. I saw him with the bloody knife and their bodies on the floor, cut open and he was eating. She was unable to go on. Eating what? Fred asked. I'm no medical professional, but I think it was their hearts. With that, she handed him a letter. On opening it, the only words were the name of the cemetery they now stood in. Fred hadn't been sure what it meant, but when Brian heard the will and asked to meet, Fred thought this was as good a place as any. 
The workshire man was so keen to get something for nothing he never even questioned it. As the twins seemed to charge at Brian without moving their legs, he let out a scream. Fred had to turn away as their hands passed through Brian's chest. He heard the screams and squelching sounds. Then he turned back. Brian was lying on the floor with his heart torn out. While Fred would never tell anyone what he had seen, he knew Brian had it coming. By sacrificing the girls, he had condemned them to becoming demons. He still thought of them as being innocent in all of this. They never asked for what happened to them. I'm Michelle Ross, and I'm coming to you from St. Paul, Minnesota. I am the author of Revenge of the Siren Song. I have a current work of historic fiction in the progress. And I'm going to tell you the tale of Letters to the Dead. While I've never seen the Flying Dutchman, I have seen a ghost ship before. We'd been trading in the Lesser Antilles aboard the Crowley when the weather began to turn foul. I had been below decks helping to secure the cargo that had gotten loose when the riggers were ordered to haul in the canvas. We'd all gathered on the deck when the lookout spotted something off the starboard side. Out of the mist and spray, we could see the lights of the aft cabin of a huge merchantman. Above the railing over the cabin, someone looked to be swinging a lantern to and fro, signaling us to follow. The mysterious merchantman led us around the eastern side of an island that we had no idea we were near, to a deep water cove on the leeward side of the island. As we dropped the anchor and made fast to ride out the storm, the other ship disappeared. We rode out the night alone and saw no sign of her the next morning. That day, we even sailed all around the island, worried that the ship that had guided us to safety had somehow wrecked in the night, but we found no sign of wreckage anywhere. It was as if the storm had swallowed her whole. There was nothing more to do but sail on. The next morning was shrouded in fog. The navigator had to mind the compass carefully. When the cloudy mist finally burned off in the midday sun, we spotted another ship. We were close enough that she looked much like the ship that saved us from the storm. The captain decided to come alongside and hail them. As we approached, we could see more details of this ship. The lines of her design were old. Nothing like her had come out of the shipyards of England in over 30 years, and yet? She looked as though she were sailing her maiden voyage. She showed no signs of decades at sea. The paint seemed fresh and there were no patches to be seen. All was quiet as we drew closer. There was no noise, not even a sign of a crew aboard. Everyone aboard the Crowley held their breath rather than break that eerie silence. As we came alongside, we could see no one on the decks above us. The captain hailed, but there was no response. He hailed again, but still not a sound came from the other ship. He drew his breath to hail a third time when a rasping, hollow voice came on the wind. Ahoy! Crowley! It seemed to hum. You seem to have fared the storm well. Are you bound for London? Aye, we are, answered the captain. His face grew pale at the sound of that soulless voice. Since you are bound for home, could we beg a favor of ye? The hollow voice moaned. Aye, we will grant you any favor in return for the help you gave us, the captain responded. A small wooden cask came over the side of the merchantman and splashed between the two ships. Inside are letters to our loved ones back home in Portsmouth. Will you see that they are delivered? The captain signaled to have the cask hauled aboard and answered, I will take your letters home. Thanks be to y'all. The voice seemed to die on the breeze as the merchantman came about and went back the way she came. For several moments, we stared at the small wooden cask sitting on the deck, 
Not a soul had the nerve to touch it. But, as the mysterious merchantman shrank into the distance, our minds seemed to clear. The captain took the cask into his cabin and ordered us all back to work. Not another thought was given to the strange ship or its little barrel of letters until we made sight of the English shore. The call at Portsmouth was a welcome rest after the long Atlantic crossing, but rather than the excited talk of food and spirits and fine women, the ship was filled with whispers of the promise made and the mysterious ship we'd encountered. The captain wasted no time inquiring of the harbor master where to hand over the letters. The official looked over several of the notes and recommended that the captain take them to the local church. The church, sir? I don't understand, the captain said, what we were all thinking. I don't pretend to know how you came by these letters, but most of them are addressed to folks that's long been laid to rest in the local churchyard. Maybe the vicar would be able to point you to the next of kin? Now, mind you, I'm not particularly religious, but... Something deep in the pit of my stomach began to gnaw at me as the captain, first mate, myself, and a couple of other stalwart lads walked through those hallowed grounds. It was nearing dusk by the time we entered the old church. The only light inside the thick walls of that sanctuary were cast by an army of candles guarding the altar. The vicar, in his billowing robes, came to greet us. Good evening, my children, he greeted us warmly. How may I be of service to you? We have these, the captain croaked, his throat so dry his voice had left him. We have these letters to deliver to families of this parish. He shoved the letters at the clergyman as if his hands would burn if he held them a moment longer. Let's see what you have here, the vicar said as he pulled a wiry pair of spectacles from a fold in his robes. The kind smile on his face began to fade as he read the names. Tell me, my son, how long have you had these letters? Not more than a couple of months, sir. We were asked to deliver them home as we set sail from the Caribbean. I'd be inclined to tell you to mind yourself in the house of God and not lie to me here, he said after a long pause. But the ink and paper are fresh. These letters couldn't possibly be 40 years old. No, sir, it's, it's just as I've told you. We were asked to take these letters home only a few months ago. Why would you think they're so old? My dear boy, these are addressed to the families of the crew of the Royal Anne. That ship was lost in a storm south of Puerto Rico nearly 40 years ago. In unison, we dropped ourselves on the nearest pew. I take it there's more yet to be told of this tale? The vicar asked as he patted the captain on the shoulder. After several stunned moments, the captain took a deep breath and related to the vicar all I've told you thus far. Hmm. Captain, I'd say that you and the crew of the Crowley have been the beneficiaries of souls caught in limbo and looking for redemption. It is now up to you to complete your vow and help these souls pass on to eternity. How do we keep our promise, sir? You said that these people have passed on themselves. Indeed, I did, the vicar smiled. The last remaining family member was laid to rest some ten years ago. I performed the rites myself. What I would suggest is that we gather some candles, go out into the churchyard, and pay our respects to the families of these wayward souls and pray that they are finally joined with them again on that side of heaven. I tell you, it was the most morbid treasure hunt I've ever taken part in. The captain and first mate took some of the candles and letters. The vicar took the rest and guided us from stone to stone looking for names that matched. When we found one, we would lay the letter against the headstone and light a candle next to it. Once all of the notes and candles were set out, we gathered back in the middle of the churchyard and followed along as the vicar prayed fervently for the souls of the lost. By the time we returned to the ship, not a one of us was interested in food, spirits, or fine women.
sometimes the frights are something right out of nature. Who among us has not recoiled in horror when walking through a spider web on a dark path? Or perhaps the crush of leaves behind you, only to realize it's a squirrel. Yes, sometimes the most frightening, yet most inexplicable things are from nature itself. As Brian from Chicagoland relates with his tale. The Hair-Raising Howl at the House of Horrors I've removed the names to protect the innocent, but I assure you that this terrifying tale is true. As Halloween neared, several friends had a great idea. It was more a scheme to raise beer money and party together. They decided to build a haunted house and charge people a couple bucks to walk through. But first, they needed a location. A garage or backyard just wouldn't do. They needed something big and scary, but most of all, remote enough to host a kegger without getting shut down by the local police. Then they remembered the farm where they baled hay last summer. It had an old abandoned barn, and they got permission from the owner and went to work. The barn was weathered gray with missing boards and shingles that would let rays of moonlight through, and the eerie shadows would often play tricks on your eyes. The building leaned a bit, and they were warned not to go upstairs because the whole structure could collapse at any time. The wind made strange howls and whines as it rushed through the cracks, and the boards creaked and moaned as the barn slowly shifted and moved. They divided the barn into rooms using plywood, old sheets and curtains, whatever they could find. The person assigned to each room was responsible for making their individual space scary. Most created costumes and based their rooms on the classics, a Dracula room with an old crate made to look like a coffin, a mummy jumping out of a sarcophagus, the chainsaw massacre room. However, one friend was having a difficult time. The mask he purchased was scary, but really couldn't be associated with a well-known horror movie. Night began to fall as they worked to add the frightening finishing touches, but as they worked they kept hearing strange noises. Was that an animal? Is there a possum or a skunk outside? The cows had been moved to another pasture so it couldn't be that, but the strange bursts of noise continued. The crowd arrived and the tour guide began ushering the group from room to room. Returning from ancient Egypt to haunt you, the curse of the mummy! The group screamed as the sarcophagus opened, and he began to walk towards them. From Transylvania comes the bloodthirsty Dracula! More screams, and so it continued, through the haunted house. Finally, they entered the last friend's yet unnamed horror room. A hush fell over the group as they waited to see what fright awaited them when in that very room the terrible noise happened again, and this time louder than ever. It was at this moment that everyone knew exactly what they had been hearing and smelling all day. As the guide ushered everyone past the flatulent box, he exclaimed, Behold, the stink man! Perhaps this story is not terrifying, but more like ripifying? So goodbye, everybody, and remember, please, for the next day or so, the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian, it's Halloween. Halloween.